Hi, I'm Peter Fisk. Work Recoded. You know, this is all about saying, how can we work together in smarter, faster organizations? And we really do need to reimagine the world of work because you could argue, you know, organizations and work practices in general are no longer fit for purpose. We work and live in a world which is changing incredibly fast. Look at all the new technologies. Look at all the challenges. Look at the global connectedness of our work. But we still kind of work in these hierarchies, in these locations, in these sometimes in these offices even, which are quite conventional or certainly traditional. Henry Ford created hierarchical organizations where he wanted all the products to be the same. And his main goal was quality and efficiency. Well, we can achieve that today, but we want something more than that. We want personalization, we want progress, and we want to do different things in different ways. And we want to use the power of diversity to create things which people never imagined before. Let's take a look at some of the changing natures of work and why we need to change. You know, organizations in which employees perceive meaning at work are 21% more profitable. However, only 13% of employees worldwide actually feel engaged in their work today. The ideal team size is between four and nine people. And actually the optimal is 4.6, according to some fantastic research by Amy Edmondson. Such teams bring diversity, but they can also make fast decisions at the same time in terms of getting things done. Around 30% of useful collaborations typically come from only 4% of employees. That's an interesting one. However, women are 66% more likely to initiate collaboration. Companies where women are at least 15% of the senior management have more than 50% higher profitability than those with less than 10% of women in senior management. Take another one. Companies in the top quartile for racial and ethnic diversity were 35% more likely to have financial returns above the national industry median. Migrants make up just 3.4% of the world's population. But they contribute nearly 10% of global GDP. And here's the thing, 51% of CEOs of unicorns, those billions dollar startup businesses, are actually migrants. 75% of the next generation, called the millennials, want to work from home or they want to work from another location where they feel more productive. And the final one of the children entry primary school today, the young children, 65% will end up working in a job category that doesn't yet exist or hasn't even been imagined. So we really need to rethink, to reimagine the world of work. You know, and this world of work is changing incredibly rapidly. Technology is probably one of the biggest drivers, not the biggest one necessarily, but one of the biggest drivers. And many people talk about how automation, be it robotics or be it in terms of simple digitalization of processes, is really challenging many, many jobs. And yes, 70% of us will probably be affected at least to 30% degree by increasing automation over the next decade. But some recent research done by the World Economic Forum says that actually so many jobs will be lost, yes, because the machines can do them better, but actually many more jobs will be created. So how can we better use the machines, apply the machines, but also how can we kind of put our talents to better uses? How can we actually unlock our skills as human beings to be much more creative? And that's really the challenge in most organizations today is how can we focus people's talents on doing more human, more inspiring and more value adding work. You know, we don't need to do those repetitive processes or even those largely knowledge based processes 
which machines can do themselves. You know, even look at lawyers, for example, which are one of the professions under most threat from artificial intelligence because most of their skill is in terms of repetition or recall of knowledge. So being able to do human work, being able to use our creative talents and collaborate in new and different ways is really how we can move organizations forward and they can have much more impact by building on what the machines can do and what the data can do and actually being more focused and being more intelligent in a sense, um, but actually achieving more at the same time. But as human beings, when we're sitting there, you know, one of the challenges is not only to achieve our business purpose, like many organizations now have, but it's also to feel more fulfilled ourselves, as we saw only 13% of us actually do. It's a fantastic book I read um, a couple of years ago. It's called Ikigai. Ikigai is a Japanese term. In a very simple translation, it means, why do I get up each morning? But in reality, what that means is, how do I achieve fulfillment in my life? And the principle of Ikigai looks at four different things. It looks at what do I love? So what do I love doing? What can I be good at doing? So where, where are my skills or where are my, where are my potential skills, my talents? What does the world need? either in terms of material commercial needs or in terms of broader problems to solve? And what can I get paid for? And, you know, that might sound incredibly simple, but have a look at that Ikigai model and think about, are you actually finding fulfillment? Are you achieving all four of those different circles and finding purpose in your job, your work and in your life? But the best organisations actually do. They find ways in which they can align people by attracting them and then working with them to achieve a bigger purpose together. So they achieve their personal and the organizational purpose at the same time. Then you get real progress. Then you get real kind of commitments to what organizations are trying to achieve and you get the multiplication effect of everybody working together to achieve that for themselves and for the organization at the same time. You know, I think a better way of defining organizations today is not like a machine, a factory like Henry Ford, but actually think about organizations, large and small, as platforms for talent. You know, how can you, as Nestle or Microsoft or whatever the company might be, or even your small business, how can you think about you being a platform for the talents of your people so that they can achieve more in themselves? And then by doing so as a platform, you can achieve more together at the same time. But what organizations really need is they need to come to life. You know, so many companies I work into and it's silent and it's gray and it's dull. But what if it could be like playing jazz? You know, a jazz band doesn't play to a strict code. It's not repetitive, it's not constant and the script is not predefined. A jazz band is a combination of great talents who work together. Yes, they have some kind of code, but they also thrive on the energy of each other. They have rhythm, so they keep moving forwards, but actually they have the agility to play to their strengths and to vary it, and you'd never have two moments which are the same as each other. So thinking how you can play jazz in your organizations and how can you create the conditions to create more energy, more rhythm, more pace, in your organization that might be changing the speed at which you do things, changing the ways in which people work together and changing the outputs or the goals which people are trying to achieve. If we look at organizations today, one of the other things about them is they're much more kind of diverse and connected, but also connected to the outside world. The, the, the boundaries are much more blurred. People inside and outside are more likely to be working on projects than on their traditional functional roles. In fact, if you look back 15, 20 years ago, around 80% of people in organizations would be defined, probably 90% actually, would be defined by their functional job descriptions. But at least 80% of people, according to the Project Management Institute, 80% of people are today defined by the projects which they're working on. 
And so in a sense, you have today, you have a group of talent, all diverse individuals from different perspectives, different backgrounds and different aspirations and different skills. And you're constantly bringing them together. You're clustering them together to work on projects, to move the organization forward, to achieve different tasks in different ways. So we largely work as project organizations and many of the people who, who are working on those projects actually come from outside the organization rather than inside. And therefore we see a, a huge growth in terms of freelance workers or gig workers as we sometimes call them, in terms of working on their specific things and then being part of organizations from time to time and then being part of other organizations at the same time or moving on from project to project. So we see organizations shifting in terms of what they are. You know, we don't have full-time work. We don't have job descriptions necessarily in the traditional sense. And often it's better not to. So organizations are shifting, if you like, from those hierarchies of the past, the layers of bureaucracy defined by their functions and their processes. They're moving to living organizations. Living organizations which are much more creative much more collaborative, and they're faster than they're constantly responding and seizing the opportunities of a changing world. But those living organizations, they, they, they stick together because they have a shared purpose. That's what kind of keeps them going in the right direction. They have focus on specific actions for short term and for long term. They have self-managed teams more often. So rather than hierarchical control, where everybody kind of looks to the limits of their responsibility and all that bureaucracy, to the point where the team make the right decisions if it, they think it's going in the right direction and they're trusted and they're empowered to by the leaders of the organization because they believe it's doing the right thing. Zhang Rumin, he's the CEO of Hire. Hire is the world's largest home appliances company, white goods like refrigerators and washing machines. When he kind of developed, uh, when he kind of grew into his job as CEO, it used to be called the Quando Refrigerator Company. It made mediocre quality refrigerators for the Chinese consumer. He lined up the products which existed at the time and he gave his top 30 leaders of the organization a sledgehammer. He said, smash these products to pieces because they are not good enough to live on a world stage. They are not world class. So he challenged them, but then he gave them the power to do better. And he really kind of took away what the traditional layers of management of what that organization had. And he created self organizing teams. Today, Hire has around 10,000 micro businesses all working underneath one corporation, one brand, if you like. And his role and the organization's role is to be the service provider, the support to those micro businesses. And so each one is very entrepreneurial. They're very close to their customer. They have a stake in the success of their businesses and they're really focused on the different activities which they do. And then Hire as a company brings all of that together. You know, in doing that, they actually realized that the vast majority of their middle management, they just didn't need because they didn't need those controlling layers which traditional organizations had. And Zhang Rumin calls this the Renden Hei approach to business. And, you know, if you look at Hire today at its headquarters in Guangdu, you see an organization which truly is not made of entrepreneurs, but true entrepreneurs inside the organization doing phenomenal, innovative things. You know, this is an example in some ways of what the academic Frédéric Laloux, French guy, he calls the teal organizations. And he really talks about these teal organizations, which are largely self-organized, but they're galvanized and they're glued together by a strong sense of purpose, which keeps evolving over time. And you can see other companies like Ben & Jerry's, for example, or Birdsog, which is a, a healthcare company from Holland. You know, companies who are really challenging the traditional approaches to business. So a great example of really building a more energized living company is Amazon. You know, way back in the 5th of July, 1994, you've probably never seen Jeff Bezos smile so much because he just thrown in his job as a banker on Wall Street. 
and he set out in his camper van with his wife on a journey from the west to the east coast. No, that's not right. From the west east to the west coast. Well, now you've thrown me off, Sorry. you see. <laughs> so, okay, right. So Amazon is a great example of a company which really is more energized and is a living organization, constantly evolving, constantly thriving in a world of change. You've probably never seen Jeff Bezos smile so much as on the 5th of July, 1994, which was day one, when he'd thrown in his job as a banker in Wall Street and he got into his camper van with his wife and they'd set off from the East Coast to the West Coast and they'd set up this new company called Amazon in Seattle. But actually day one still exists in Amazon. This is the new headquarters building uh, recently constructed in Seattle. And it's actually called the day one building as a, a reminder that in Amazon, it is always day one. Because you, you know, yourself know that day one is when you have dreams. Day one is when you're excited. Day one is when you can achieve anything. Day two is when the emails pile up, when the meetings get too many, when the tasks, the task click grows stronger, longer. So day one is the day you need to stay at. Day one is when you're constantly in your imagination and that kind of mindset for always being entrepreneurial stays with Jeff Bezos. You know, any business case, any proposal, it always has to be on one page. Any project starts off by writing the imaginary press release as to what they would say when the product is finally released even if they haven't even created it yet. So they start from what will it look like? What will it feel like? What will they say? Any project is always based on a pizza team. Remember 4.6 people, the optimum team size. So a pizza team can share a pizza. And so that's what they call it. And that's the kind of number of people they would always allocate to any task. Think about Netflix. You know, Reed Hastings passionately says in Netflix, there are no rules. So on Netflix, you can go on vacation whenever you want to. There is no set number of days leave and there is no questions asked whenever you want to take a day off because he wants people to come to work with a higher purpose and with a higher energy than thinking about such things as that. And when there's no rules in the many different ways, then you start to get people leading with a bigger context. They see a bigger reason why they come to work and they have better ideas as a result of it. Transparency is also incredibly important. So everybody knows what everybody earns. Everybody knows what everybody does inside Netflix. Anybody can challenge anybody because the purpose why we're all there is to achieve something bigger and to achieve it together. So any organization today the challenge of work is about really how can you kind of achieve more and how can you keep transforming, like Frederick Gladue said, as an organization. This is a great roadmap, which comes from a company in Norway called Strategy Tools. And it looks at the 10 stages by which you can transform your organization. Not just digital transformation, which you probably hear a lot about today, applying technology to automate the process. That's not really what we're trying to do. But really, how can you transform your business? How can you move forwards in a much more fundamental way, both in terms of the markets and the activities you do for your customers outside, but also the ways in which you work inside? A great example of this is DBS Bank in Singapore. DBS was recently voted the world's most innovative bank. And its CEO, Payush Gupta, you know, he has a passion for constantly how can you think better? And he started off by looking at the bank and he's saying, well, how can actually I create a better bank for my customers? There was long queues when they went to the branches, for example. The website wasn't intuitive in terms of how to work. So he started from a customer centric view in terms of how can you improve the processes and the activities of the bank? Then he said, well, how can I use these new technologies to actually make that even better once I've changed the processes? So customer transformation, then digital transformation added to that. And then he said, strategically, where are we actually going? And actually, the big thing for DBS Bank is to think about not being a bank. You know, people actually don't care about banks. It's what they do with their money, which they care about. So he created this strategy of being an invisible bank 
But what he means is how banking or how money can be part of the world of healthcare, of education, of retail, whatever it might be. And he set about creating hackathons across his entire business and every, every country in which they work and all the different teams coming together to rapidly work on the ideas of everybody to say, how could we entrepreneurial create the invisible bank? One example of what emerged was a, a kind of fitness tracker, which now every child who goes to school in Singapore wears. And that fitness tracker is a GPS tracker, so your parents know where you are, but also it's gamified, so you can look at how many steps you've taken, and so you can compare that, and you can kind of, you know, get more involved in it. But it's also gamified, so it gives access to collaborative gaming between the children. And the third thing related to banking, but in the fitness tracker, is that it's actually a payment device. And so the kids don't need to carry any money to school because with that they pay for their transport or they pay for their food whilst they're at school. But what it also means is that it has 100% market penetration of children in Singapore. So a really great example of thinking differently about what a bank can do for people. So making change is never easy. You know, but constantly we're looking to change the day. And we're all familiar with the change curve, the challenge that we don't like something different from what we're used to. But part of our emotional agility in a world which is relentlessly changing is that we need to kind of grow to love change much more. It's never going to be perfect and you're always going to have to work hard at it. But really finding ways in which you can overcome that shock and that pre preference for doing the same old things to do things newly. And there's a very simple model I use. It's called A times B times C is greater than D. If A is a better vision of where we're going, a better vision for the future, which leaders can give. B is the reasons why you can't stay as you are. C are the practical steps to move forwards. And D is the reasons not to do it. So if you can get the vision and the, the reason why we can't stay as we are and the practical steps forward, if you can get all of those together and they together are more compelling than the reason to stay as we are, people will change. So, you know, a great example is Ørsted. Ørsted's a Danish company which 10 years ago was almost completely a carbon-based energy company. So producing coal-fired energy um, for Denmark and surrounding markets. Over the last 10 years, it's put its mind to it. It's completely transformed its company. This year, it was voted the world's most sustainable organization. And it's truly made that shift from black to green. So really thinking in a different way about how can you use renewable energies compared to fossil fuel energies and some acquisitions on the way. But actually, they've created a company which is three times more profitable than the organization which used to exist beforehand. So finally, you know, ultimately, business is really about how can you create great teams. Teams of people who can do amazing things. And if you look across the world, who are the great teams? Who are the extreme teams who are both successful, but they work incredibly productively together as a group of diverse individuals? And one of them you'd always call out is the New Zealand rugby team, more commonly known as the All Blacks. And there's a number of things which are really distinctive about the way in which the All Blacks play and go about rugby. Firstly, is that they have a we culture. Truly it is the team and the we, not the I, which matters. No one is bigger than the team. Then they have their language and their rituals. You know, you can see here the haka, which they always do at the beginning of any match. But they always have a, also have a language for a series of activities which they do during their training as well as during their competitive performance. Of course, with any team in sports, it's what happens on the field which matters. And then the leader, if you like, the bosses, they no longer have any control. They're sitting on the sidelines. So it's how you empower the team to work together. Everybody, in a sense, is a leader inside that a team in the, in, in, once they're playing. They train to win. So they're constantly looking for not just playing well, but playing to win. Uh, but they realize that champions, although they might become the best in the world, they constantly need to do better. And the motivation for that comes from inside, 
but it also comes back from their fans and the incredible high expectations which they have. And two final things which are really interesting. Firstly, they're a true learning organisation. So the first thing we'll do after any match, probably after any success, is that we'll say, what can we learn from that? What could we do better next time? And I think today, you know, any organisation is truly a learning organisation, constantly using every moment, every experience to say, what can we learn from that? What can we do different? What can we do better? Not necessarily the same, but learn from it each time. And this idea of constantly learning in different ways is really, really important. The other thing is, what is your legacy? What is the difference you've made to the world? And what is the story, what is the legend you leave behind for the world when you're gone. So a great example of an extreme team, which really is what organizations are all about. So you can find out more in my new book, Business Recoded, which starts off with this idea of how can we make more enlightened progress? How can we drive better growth? How can we create markets rather than just compete in them? How can we be more ingenious rather than just innovating in the traditional ways? How can we bring together new partners as ecosystems dynamically moving forward with more energy and pace? How can we sustain transformations in terms of the ways in which we work, constantly responding, but also anticipating and shaping a changing world? And how as leaders, and we're all leaders in some ways, how can you not just be ordinary, but extraordinary? You know, leaders amplify the potential of people in the world of work. And so how can you deliver more impact? How can you make change? But also how can you create a better future? And in the book, we look at the 49 codes, which are kind of deconstructions from what all the best companies in the world are doing right now. And then for you to construct in the relevant best way for your organization, for how can you create a better organization, a better way of working for a better future. So this is one of five programs um, which we're bringing together in terms of the Business Recoded series. There's one on future, one on growth, one on innovation, and one on leadership. But for now, thank you very much for watching. Be bold, be brave, and be brilliant.